it's really wonderful to meet all of you. Some of you I've had the chance to meet in person over the last day or so, and I look forward to meeting more of you today. I'm really excited to be here and to be able to share this talk for a couple reasons. So one reason is that I've been an admirer of the Buck Institute's work for a long time, and it's exciting to be a part of this historic event, and I really do see it as a historic event. So I'm excited to be here and be a part of that. The second reason um, is that I'm really excited to be here talking to all of you. I spend a lot of my time working with and talking to folks who I don't think are as ready or as committed to this kind of work as the folks in this room. I want to humbly propose a ninth essential uh, to project-based learning. You know, I figure I'm the new kid on the block. I'll just show up and just try to change everything. Um, <laughs> and I was actually a little concerned about it. I was going to you know, check in with the powers that be and make sure it's cool. But then I was searching on my computer for um, this document that you may be familiar with. The, um, eight Essentials of Project-Based Learning that the Buck Institute put out. And I put Essentials Project-Based Learning, and this document came up. And it must be some phantom earlier version that John had shared with me at some point or something. <laughs> but I figured if there was a seven, a seven Essentials of Project-Based Learning, and now there's eight, maybe we could get a ninth in. So my hope is that you all are going to uh, you know, be so excited about what I share that you're all going to put on your evaluation form, most definitely. We have to have. Um, you know, this, this ninth essential to project-based learning. Um, so I want to share with you uh, my idea for what that is, and that's the subject of my talk today. Um, and that's called Keeping It Real. And so a lot of my work um, emanates from hip-hop culture. And this is a very popular phrase and ethos in the hip-hop community, keep it real. When I work with young people, I like to ask them what music they're listening to. Um, and often then I'll ask them, you know, so why? Why do you like that artist? And before they say his lyrics or um, his, his flow or his voice, and it's often his because there's a lot of male rappers in the hip hop space, but um, they say because he's real, right? And what they mean by that is that um, he is who he says he is. He speaks from experience and he lives what he talks about, right? Um, so being authentic to who you are and really doing things as opposed to just talking about them are paramount values in, in hip hop communities. Um, we're all here because we know that students learn best through projects, but I'm gonna argue that students learn even better through individualized, real-world projects that are relevant to who they are. So I'm going to unpack that idea um, and the relevance of Keep It Real for project-based learning in general. Um, but first, I want to keep it real with, with all of you and tell you a little bit about who I am and what brings me to the beliefs that I have. So this is me in uh, kindergarten. There's the arrow, in case you weren't sure uh, <laughs> which one was me. Um, I grew up going to alternative public schools. Um, when I got too old to go to alternative public schools, I started working in them. As Al mentioned, I've taught in elementary, middle, high school, and uh, college as well. Um, and uh, studied and have a degree in education, history, and policy, and I'm certified to teach high school language arts. Um, I've also been a lifelong fan and creator of uh, hip hop, in particular rap music. Um, when I was five, I recorded my first rap song. It's called the Ewok Rap. That was. <laughs> That was probably the height of my career as a rapper, but I've continued to try. Um, and uh, one other thing that, that Al didn't share about me in, in the bio, I was a little surprised, and it, it may go without saying, but I just want to mention it in case no one's noticed, is that I'm white. Um, and I feel like that's important to mention when I talk about hip hop culture, because it is a culture that, that has been created and innovated primarily by black folks as well as Latino folks, and folks from all races, including white, but I just feel like coming up here and purporting to be an expert on a culture that in some ways I'm very much a part of and in some ways is not mine, it's important to acknowledge that and to acknowledge issues of race um, in all the work that we do. So what I want to tell you a little bit about is how my work um, in education and my love of hip hop, music, and culture intersected. And um, I think Al mentioned that I, I worked in a juvenile prison and that was where I did my student teaching when I was in college. And, um, when I went in and, uh, on the first day and I had my lesson plan and it had been approved by my professors at Brown and um, you know, I had gone over it a bunch of times and I think it was on democratic participation or something like that and I had a bunch of questions I wanted to ask um, and I like, immediately lost control of the class in this maximum security unit and people were slap boxing with each other and trying to get into the file cabinet and catching up on things and a couple students who were in the front um, kind of turned the tables and started asking me questions about who I was, where I was from, um, you know, trying to figure out how real I was, basically. Um, and when they asked me what kind of music I liked, and I said I liked hip-hop music, um, they were amused by that, and they weren't expecting it. And then when I said I thought I could rap, they were incredibly tickled. <laughs> um, and they wanted to hear me rap, but in an earnest way. They said they really, nothing was going to happen um, until I rapped. So, um, 
I did, I did what we in the, in the hip hop community call freestyling. Do people know what that is? Wow, okay, wait a second. How many hip hop heads do we have here? I should have asked this first. Okay. And who's like, and don't be shy now that you've seen how many people are in here like loving hip hop. Who, who doesn't engage with the culture at all? And is maybe even a little skeptical about whether it has any place in a conversation about education. Okay, good. So we have, we have another goal is to you know, win you over today. Um, so, um, so I freestyle, which is improvisational rap. You're making up rhymes as you go. And I, you know, I don't remember what I talked about. Probably what a great rapper I was. That's what you usually talk about. But um, two things happened that were really striking to me. One, the entire room immediately fell silent. And the level of intense focus was mind boggling to me. I mean, I had everyone's attention in a way I could, at the beginning of that class, could have never anticipated. And the other thing that happened was a whole bunch of the young men came up. Um, and it's a prison, so it's you know, separated by gender. A whole bunch of the young men came up and formed what we call in hip hop a cypher, which is a circle. And they started rhyming. So we were sharing. And, and that day I met um, this young man, Matthew Amasori, who's one of the best freestyle artists I've ever heard. He had been in there a long time and was just this natural leader that all the other young men followed. So once he was up there rhyming with me, it was like I was a made man in there. It was like, you know, I just had this level of respect. And another was Jacob Delgado. Um, and Jacob, who I'd been told was illiterate, um, each week would come to class with a, comp a new composition book full of rhymes, um, creative spelling, you know, all of that. Um, but clearly highly literate. Um, I started working really intensely with these guys and a small crew in the maximum security unit, and then um, they got out. The winter of my senior year in December, um, Jacob was online at a food truck on a street in Providence called Broad Street and was shot and killed waiting for um, some food. And two months later, on February 13th, um, this is 10 years ago, 2002, um, the day before his 19th birthday, Matthew was shot and killed. Um, just a few blocks from there by a 14-year-old who, you know, weeks later was in the same unit of maximum security that he had been in. Um, and I tell you this because it was a, a complete turning point in my life. Uh, first of all, it was a complete emotional breakdown for me. Um, but it also led me to come up with a driving question for myself. And I know within the context of the Buck Institute, we, also, we often talk about driving questions in relation to student projects. But I also believe that um, driving questions are the things that come up in these really important moments of our lives and that we then struggle with um, for years. So this was a personal one for me. How can I help keep young people like Matthew and Jacob alive and support their growth as leaders? And then I started doing work three days after graduating from college, developing a youth program with a number of other people who were about my age. So we were young ourselves, trying to build a program for folks a little bit younger. And um, so this became kind of the public version of the question. How can we engage the brilliance of all young people and ensure that they're able to thrive and contribute to society? And this has really been a question that I've been trying to answer throughout my career. So this was uh, Broad Street Studios, the name of the youth program that um, we started and, and built. And uh, we worked with young people while they were in prison and as they transitioned out of prison. And basically what we did, as we figured it out, as we were building the plane by flying, we started um, youth-run, arts-based businesses. So we had um, mural painting, um, we had photography, magazines, recording hip hop albums, recording other kinds of music, doing live events and shows. And through this, young people were learning really valuable life skills and also feeling like their culture and their identity and their creative energy was being valued and respected. Um, and so you know, they were learning how to show up on time or at least call if they weren't gonna be able to make it quite on time. Um, they, you know, everything from writing graffiti to writing grants, from planning trips to planning meetings, you know, we were really trying to instill all those skills. And this is the place where I had the most in-depth experience with project-based learning. And so it wasn't a school environment, right? It was a, you know, we were in a garage, um, you know, on Broad Street. Um, so I know that I didn't have to deal with some of the confines or, you know, um, structures that you have to deal with in school. But I also didn't get to deal with the money you get to deal with in a school. I mean, we were doing this very, very grassroots. So it's a little bit different, but for me, it was the exposure that made me say there's something real here that's really engaging young people and keeping them involved. This is the crew, um, circa 2004. Um, we called ourselves the coolest gang ever because the idea was to take everything about gangs that young people needed, like love and a sense of community and um, a feeling of safety and a way to make some money, but do it in a really positive way. So that was, that was what we were doing. Um, but the problem was that a lot of the young people hadn't graduated from high school. And as they were getting older, they didn't want to leave the program. So they were getting to be 21, 22, 23, and they, they wanted to continue to participate as youth in the program because it was the best opportunities, and they were making money through our youth-run businesses. And that felt wrong to me, and I started to feel like providing a quality in-school education was the most important thing that I could be involved in. 
um, and had to be a part of the answer to my driving question. So I wasn't alone in thinking this. I want to do a, give you a quick quiz, because we all know that multiple choice is the best way to learn and assess, right? <laughs> um, so who said the quote above? We're just going to do a quick show of hands. If you see the name and you think it's them, uh, put your hand up. Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. He could have said that, right? Secretary of Ed? No, wow, OK. <laughs> Presidential candidate, Mitt Romney. I'm not, I'm not going to see a lot more hands. Oh, I got one. OK. Singer, songwriter, John Legend. Come on, John Legend. OK, I got one. Former President George W. Bush. OK, you're running out of options here. <laughs> John Legend. Shout out who you think it was. Wow, nice. OK, you're all right. Oh, they all said it. Um, so we all seem to agree right, that education is the civil rights issue of our time. It seems like young people who have access to resources, um, if they struggle in a traditional environment, there are other options. But for folks like the young people I was working with at Broad Street Studio, if they struggle in traditional environments, there often aren't other options. And what I was seeing at that time in the school reform movement was that a lot of the options that were being provided were actually just more regimented, heavier doses of the traditional stuff that had not worked for those students in the first place. Um, so in the midst of all this, there was something else very cool happening right in Providence, um, you know, just a mile from where I was. And that was that a group called Big Picture had formed. Um, and their goal was to change the way education works in this country. Have folks heard of Big Picture? OK, a little bit, a little bit. What they did was they started a school called the Met School. And it's a highly project-based um, school where students learn through real-world internships. So starting beginning of ninth grade, all students in Big Picture schools are out in the community. And they, they're doing a project in a workplace, whether it's a bakery or a veterinary clinic or a law office um, or a hip-hop studio or a radio station. Um, they're out in the community learning through internships. Um, and around the same time, a foundation was formed um, by Bill and Melinda Gates. And one of their major priorities was education in the US. And they were looking for disruptive models that were really going to change education. And they, they saw a big picture. And they said, hey, we like what you're doing. Um, we would really love for you to do a lot more of it. And they said, if we gave you a multi-million dollar grant, could you open a lot more schools? And since their goal had been to change education in the country, the founders of Big Picture said, yes, we'd love to do that and started a network of schools. Around the same time, the Gates Foundation was having the same kind of conversation and making grants to a number of other youth development organizations. I'm going to just put a few of their logos. Ed Visions, highly project-based model as well, more in the school than big picture, um, but individualized products for, projects for students. Um, some of these networks use different strategies, all innovative approaches to working with students who traditional schools have not worked for. Once the foundation had funded about a dozen of these organizations, um, I couldn't make a graphic that showed all those. It would have been, they would have been too tiny. Um, we had all these networks and started to realize it's really hard to take a great model, you know, whether it's within a school and bring it out to the whole school or with one school and bring it out to the whole country. Um, and the foundation came back to Big Picture and said, could you create a network of the networks and help everyone learn from each other? And so for five years, I had the opportunity to serve as the director of annual reviews and partnerships for this national network. This is from 2010. It's, it's the size that the network had grown to by that time. And you can see the big picture schools are up there in red. Uh, the Ed Vision schools are in purple. But basically, I got to visit a lot of incredible schools, meet with a lot of incredible school leaders, see a lot of project-based learning in action. And as I've continued as an independent consultant, I've gotten to do even more of that and spent time at some of the greatest project-based learning schools in the country, which has been really incredible, including the big picture schools, the Ed Vision schools, um, High Tech High in San Diego, and others. Um, so I've gotten a really good first-hand education in getting to spend time in these project-based learning schools. But there was one school that I visited in particular that really brought me back and felt like a hybrid between these great project-based learning models and the program that we had been running in the garage on Broad Street. And it was called the High School for Recording Arts. Um, and it's in St. Paul, Minnesota. Students at HSRA come from the toughest circumstances. About 60% in any given time are adjudicated, 30% um, homeless, 20% um, are parents or are, are pregnant while they're in school. Um, but unlike many schools that are set up for those populations of students, it's not a place to just warehouse students or teachers. It's a really vibrant environment. And when you walk in, you see professional quality recording studios. Um, you see a record label boardroom. You see dance studios, graphic design studios, um, meeting spaces. This is a schematic of the school where you can kind of get a feel for the flow of the space. Um, one of my favorite things is in this big space, this orange space is a performance space. And in there, there's vending machines. And, instead, and in addition to snacks, the vending machines sell blank CDs because students are working on projects and um, always wanting to burn things out. So, um, there's a, immediately a million clues that this place is really different. And, and that came across to me, but it comes across to the students who step through the doors as well. Um, 
This is just one image of what the, one of their big open workspaces. And this is a model. The school is part of the EdVisions network, and this is a, a model that's typical to an EdVisions school. Anyway, I was so inspired after getting to see the school that, that I made what was in retrospect maybe kind of a rash decision and decided to move to Minnesota in November. Um, so <laughs> this, this quickly became my reality. But despite the weather, I stayed out there for a year and a half and did PD with the staff and got to know the students and really just spent a lot of time with the community observing. Um, and in partnership with the leaders of the school and also with some colleagues from around the country, we started to form um, some ideas around hip hop and education. A lot of what's been done around hip hop education, and there is a lot that has been done, um, is really about taking rap lyrics into a classroom, in a fairly traditional classroom. And it's often English or maybe social studies. Um, but I felt like, and, and our group started to feel like, it was too literal in terms of hip hop having to mean rap lyrics and too literary in terms of being you know, something that's basically used in English classes. And we really wanted to explore the other implications of hip hop for education. We knew that hip hop came out of young people, the most disenfranchised young people, the same folks who were failing with our schools, inventing this cultural form in a situation where they had very little. And we as educators are in somewhat of a similar position, under-resourced, needing to do the same thing, innovate. So why can't we learn from the students that we're doing the worst job with rather than continue to fail them? So um, you know, we had a lot of great conversations about this. and. Um, it turned into about five years of work for me, and over that course of time, I wrote an entire book about it called Hip Hop Genius, Remixing High School Education. And I'm now going to read the entire book to you. <laughs> no, no, luckily, luckily I put together a four minute video um, that I can show. So basically what I'm gonna do is show this video, it's four minutes long. This gives you a real flavor for what I'm talking about when I talk about hip hop and education. And then I'll segue from that into really getting more specifically into the implications for project-based learning. When I was 20 years old, I started teaching at a juvenile prison. While there were many things that separated us, I quickly discovered my students and I had one big thing in common, our love of hip hop. For the next few years, rap music became the main content for the classes I taught, and I saw disengaged students emerge as leaders and experts. Through engaging elements of hip hop culture together, students and I learned language arts, life skills, and to love each other and ourselves more. As I continued to observe the ways in which our education system is rigged against black and Latino students and students from low-income communities, I asked myself what else we as educators could learn from hip hop, the insanely innovative and influential global phenomenon that has emerged from those very same communities. When I say hip hop, I'm not just talking about music or music, graffiti, and dance, which are considered its central elements. I'm referring to the blend of instincts, confidence, and ingenuity that develops in oppressed communities as has been demonstrated through the evolution of hip hop culture. I'm talking about a Jamaican teenager in the South Bronx taking two records of the same song and fading back and forth between them to create a new musical composition by playing the most danceable segment over and over. I'm talking about aspiring visual artists realizing they didn't need galleries to represent them for their work to be seen, and instead painting on train cars and instantly having an audience of hundreds of thousands. I'm talking about a high school dropout from the projects of Marcy, using his entrepreneurial hustle and rap skills to go from selling drugs, to selling CDs out of the trunk of his car, to selling products at Macy's. This is what my colleagues and I call hip-hop genius, creative resourcefulness in the face of limited resources or as it is often said in the hip hop community, flipping something out of nothing. How can this audacious approach impact our education system? For starters, we need to exhibit the brash creativity of hip hop's pioneers. Just as hip hop producers sampled songs from other genres, creating unique new sounds to please audiences' ears, hip hop educators can borrow from diverse models and improvise innovative blends of educational practices customized to meet students' needs. If that sounds too abstract, take a look at the High School for Recording Arts in Minnesota, where they've mixed project-based learning and competency-based assessment with artistic, vocational, and business training with dual enrollment at local colleges with a heavy dose of student leadership. We don't have to do the same thing that's been done before or follow one model. We can sample and mix multiple teaching techniques and school designs to find the blends that best serve our students. We also need to adopt the value hip-hop places on staying fresh. A hot beat yesterday was a hot beat yesterday. Whoever sets out to make a hot beat today has to do something new and different to remain relevant. The world is changing rapidly around us. The top 10 jobs in 2010 didn't exist six years earlier. Hip hop's premium on freshness must permeate our schools. And we need to be resourceful. In the 1970s, thousands of families chose to replace their linoleum floors. In poor neighborhoods, the old linoleum was left in piles on the street. Young people, without access to playgrounds or dance classes, turned their parents' trash into dance floors and invented new moves like the windmill and the headspin to maximize its potential. 
Faced with our own resource constraints, educators need to find new platforms. What refuse could we be dancing on, and what are our new moves? Behind the mic, spray cans, turntables, and when it comes to their educations, students have brilliant ideas and instincts. Hip Hop Genius is not just about teachers using hip hop songs to get kids to succeed in traditional schools. It's about changing education to respect and build from young people's brilliance. It's about the incredible possibilities that occur when students are engaged, not as consumers, but as creators. We don't need to tweak the content inside existing traditional academic structures. We need to think outside the classroom and build institutions that are fundamentally more responsive to young people's interests and ingenuity. We need to create schools and school systems that not only teach hip hop, they are hip hop. So I wanted to share that because, um, first of all, um, hopefully you know you can get some things out of the the content and the metaphors and whatnot that I shared. But also because the video itself is actually an example of project-based learning. So that's why it's a, it, for me it's a good segue into zeroing in on certain aspects of PBL. Um, this is Mike who created the video, and he's a student um, at Big Picture, um, the organization that I was talking about earlier. Uh, first college. It's called College Unbound. And what they've done is created a project-based learning college that functions very similar to their high school model. And so uh, for Mike, this video was a chunk of his work for one of his semesters. Um, when he came, he started with sailing. He was really passionate about sailing. But then he saw, has anybody ever seen an RSA animate video? OK, so Mike saw an RSA animate video, and he got really inspired. It was the one with Sir Ken Robinson, I think, talking about education, actually. And he, uh, he decided he needed to do it. So he sold his sailboat. He bought a big whiteboard. You can see it in the background there. Um, he bought a really good camera and you know, some other equipment. And he just started trying to make these videos. And he first made one about a local issue. And he wasn't satisfied. The white of the whiteboard didn't look white on the video. And it drove him crazy. So he worked on that and learned all the technical stuff uh, to do color correction. Um, then he wanted to do, put in animations, because RSA Animate doesn't do that. They just speed up a drawing of themselves drawing. He wanted to be able to do stop motion animation. So he taught himself to do that. Um, so he was innovating and, and just teaching himself how to do this. We hooked up and started talking about my work and decided to produce this video together. So instead of what I did in college, right, which was write papers that never saw the light of day beyond a professor's mailbox, Mike is producing a video in his first or second year at College Unbound that's been viewed, just this one video, and he has a bunch of really great videos. You should definitely check out his website, drawnalong.com. Um, really powerful, um, both the content and his style. It's just, he just keeps evolving it. Um, but just this video has been viewed over 35,000 times, translated into Spanish, uh, Finnish, Japanese. Um, you know, has really gotten out there. And even Sir Ken Robinson um, tweeted about it, which is really cool for Mike, because that was what had gotten him into do it, doing this in the first place, and cool for, for me, of course, too. Um, so this is a, is a great example of a real-world project. The whole thing was shot also in the seminar space for College Unbound. A lot of people think that's an apartment, but it was actually their seminar space. And um, just as a side note, that some of the young folks at the end who were dancing and, and rapping were actually from the youth program that I talked about earlier, Broad Street Studio. So it was kind of a cool convergence of the big picture and the, the um, hip-hop community um, to produce this video. But this leads into the um, proposed, for now it's just proposed, uh, ninth essential. Um, and that is keeping it real. And there are actually two pieces to keeping it real. The first is about keeping it real world. And this is about getting at all the powerful motivation and learning that Mike experienced since he started doing these videos. And it may sound like an overwhelming thing to try to provide to a group of students, but I, I'd argue that it's not. I'd argue that it's actually easier to help each student find a project that really resonates for them than to try to find one, one project that resonates for everybody. And I'd argue that it's easier to find projects that really exist in the real world that's all around us than it is to fabricate an environment and a project within that environment. Um, and I also think that doing real world projects in this way is preparing students for the world way better. I was actually sitting on the airplane on my way out here, and a guy was looking over my shoulder at this presentation as I was working on it. And he asked me what project-based learning was. And then, before I could answer, proceeded to tell me that he was a senior project manager at a glass company. Um, and he started complaining to me about the college grad business school graduates that he gets, that he hires as project managers who don't know how to manage projects and don't ha have the um, style of thinking that he needs them to have. They don't ask questions like, how could I make this more efficient? How could I make this safer? Um, they, they have the book knowledge about what a pro you know, how you should manage a project, but they've never done it. So he was really fascinated by the idea that we're all going to be here talking about 
high school students, or in, in some cases younger students, learning these skills and wanted to know how he could connect. Um, so I hooked him up with my brother, who teaches at a project-based learning school in Oakland, Met West, and hopefully they're going to have an internship at the um, glass factory in Oakland. Um, <laughs> But you know, just hearing that from him reminded me of, of how important it is in preparing young people for the real world to do real world projects. To bring it back to the High School for Recording Arts um, in St. Paul, after I'd been working on the book for a couple of years, I shared a draft of it with some mentors. And one of the pieces of advice I got was that I needed, to, it was, the school was so different, I needed to show a day in the life of a student there so that people who weren't familiar with it could really um, understand what it's like to be there. And so I went back out to Minnesota. Luckily, it was a better time of year. And, um, I followed a student named Lil C. And Lil C is an incredible MC. She's a great rapper. But she was doing a couple projects. She was making a song. She was going to submit for a movie called Step, Step Up 3. But she was also uh, working on a book about people's astrology signs and how that connected um, to their personalities. And she was having everyone she interviewed while I was observing her fill out a permission form um, that had a lot of legal jargon on it. And I asked her about it, what that was for. And she said, well, if you're interviewing somebody for a book, you have to get permission. And so I put together this form. And I said, you, you do? Um, you know. So I, I ran outside and called my publisher. And they said, oh, yeah, most definitely. You have to have permission from everybody, especially if they're under 18. Then you need their parents' permission, too. I've been working on the book for years. I hadn't asked for anybody to sign anything. So I actually took Lil C's permission form that she was using for her astrology book and, and changed the name and put Hip Hop Genius and, and had her and everyone I could catch sign it. But that's an example of how she was learning something in high school a very practical skill and just sensibility that I never got in, in my experience. Um, and you know, I think that that's, you know, that's one of the things that doing these real world projects brings to us. And for Lil C, she may never write a book professionally. That might not be the career she chooses. But that kind of way of thinking and the comfort, you know, being comfortable picking up a phone and calling a lawyer and saying, OK, I want to craft this document, that's what I'm really getting at. Um, so I want to show you another example um, from the High School for Recording Arts. Usually when I present about their work, I really like to have students and staff from the school with me. And I couldn't this time, so I asked them to shoot like a little video. And I was picturing like a minute long thing in the hallway that was kind of hard to hear. And um, of course, being the school that they are, being project based and really caring about the quality of their products, they sent me something pretty polished. But I'm going to share, it's about a four minute clip. I'm just going to share two minutes now and then we'll talk a little more and then I'll share the other, you know, the last two minutes of it. But, um, I, don't, I don't even want to say too much about it because Aaliyah, who's the student in the video, will, will tell you about um, her real world project. Before you graduate, college won't have to wait. You can jump start your future, be early, never late. Hey, the success project came about because. Center of School Change came to the school and they wanted us to do a video about college preparation courses and to get us involved with AP, IB, and PSEO courses and get other students involved too. For everyone who doesn't know, PSEO is post-secondary enrollment options. That means for your last two years of high school, you get a chance to enroll in college for free to prepare yourself for college before you actually are in college. So um, I already had a song called Success and they heard it and they liked it, but they wanted me to maneuver it in a way to make it about you know, college preparation courses. I heard about AP and IB, I heard about it, but when I researched it, I actually found more about it. So in the song, I was able to elaborate on it and what's it about and what grade you have to be and how old you have to be, what, what are the requirements and things like that. My role in the project was to write the song, you know, kind of be the face of the video. Um, my sister, Aida, she actually choreographed the video with my sister, Audrey, and they made up a dance for us to dance. And, when I first started the Success Project, I knew that I was going to be able to get some type of school credit and stuff like that, but after all the research that I did and after everything that I was able to find out about it, I actually enrolled myself in PSEO. I've been in a traditional school setting before, and the project-based setting, it's, it's you get more involved with what you want to do and it makes you more interested. I mean, if I was at a traditional school and they asked me to do an essay about PSEO, IB or AP, you know, I'd be... I do it because I need the credit, but it, it wouldn't be so. I wouldn't take the initiative to. It what? It's not fun, <laughs> you know. It's like um, I got to kind of see like how it's shot, how many times you have to do it, how many, and how long it takes to edit it, and things like that. I mean, I was I was in front of the camera most of the time, but I paid attention to behind the camera, and I learned about you know all the the hard work that it takes to actually make a video. Okay, so I'm just going to pause it there for a moment um, and just you know, highlight all the uh, 
21st century skills that Aaliyah touches on in that clip, the critical thinking, the creativity, the collaboration with her sisters, um, and you know, not learning from a simulation of something, but learning from really doing a project and making this video. In the second clip, you'll get to see the, the finished project. Um, but I think, and I think part of what makes this so compelling for Aaliyah, as it did for Mike, is that she knows that thousands of her peers and other folks are going to see it, right? And that really matters. Um, and this is one of the things that's great about, uh, I think, project-based learning, this kind of teaching and learning, is that it lends itself to um, a very rigorous and authentic form of assessment. Um, it's I, what the Buck Institute, I believe, calls publicly presented product, um, or what. Um, and my, my friend Kazi talks about edubabble, a, a lot of the terms I use, he calls edubabble. We call it um, you know, competency-based or performance-based assessment. But in the hip-hop community, we call it show and prove. Um, and the basic idea is that you can't fake the funk, right? If you want to prove that you're a good break dancer, you don't write an essay about how you know, you're a good break dancer. You have to get out there on the concrete and really do the moves in front of an audience of your peers, and you're going to you know, be judged by that. Before coming back to the other side of keeping it real that I want to talk about, um, I want to just um, revisit my guys from Big Picture Learning, because I did learn so much from them about the real world aspect of keeping it real. And this is uh, Elliot Washer and Dennis Litke, and those are the founders of Big Picture, and they've, you know, I've learned a lot from both of them. Elliot has a book coming out with a, another guy named Charlie Mojowski, um, and in it they're talking about the importance of real world learning. A lot of the book is, and I, I wish I could tell you the name, but it doesn't have a name yet, but I did get to read it, and I'm going to share a little sneak preview with you. Um, and in the book, Elliot says, Young people view going to school as going to a restaurant and being fed the menu rather than what's on the menu. The settings, people, places, and context of school are at best fake real, scripted like reality television. In school, most experiences are indirect and students have no firsthand experience with real world mysteries and problems. The curriculum scope and sequence fails to reflect the way that knowledge and skills are used in the real world. Young people ask their schools for authentic learning experiences. They want assurances that these experiences will help them to be competent and prepare them for success in their future work and careers. They want firsthand experiences for developing these competencies, and they want those experiences to mirror the way that professionals in the real world perform and learn. So I just thought that was a really nice piece that sums up his passion around real world learning. Um, Dennis uh, also has a book. Um, his book is already out, so I'm going to do a little promotion for him here. It's called The Big Picture. In the, in the book, he, he, you know, he talks a lot about project-based learning, but in particular, he tells this one story about a teacher who does a project based around the election, and she has her students research candidates and their positions and educate and register voters, and the project is a great success, and the, all the students get A's, and they love it. And then they do another project, I think it was about geography, where they're, um, the students are planning trips, and they're really calling a real travel agent, but the, pro the project just doesn't take off the way that she wanted it to, and she asks Dennis, why, why do you think this project wasn't as successful? And his answer was simple, because they knew that the trips they were planning weren't real. They weren't going to go on the trips, so they weren't as engaged in planning them, right? Um, and he continually in the book, in the book pushes um, us around what real means and whether we're being real enough. And he also talks about fake real, as Elliot did in the quote above. Um, and he points out that while many teachers try to create lessons that look and feel real, all the while there's a real world going on right out there that we can actually be accessing. Um, so why don't we just step back outside? So hopefully that's enough provocation for the moment on keeping it real world. Let's talk about the other aspect of keeping it real, authenticity. And as I said in the video, I think we need to create or even just sometimes allow space and validation for experiences that honor young people's culture and ingenuity. Um, rather than trying to force them into boxes or sometimes even projects that don't resonate with their identities. Um, from my experience, one of the most powerful things about project-based learning is that while most schools force students, particularly students who don't identify with the dominant cultural paradigm, um, to conform, project-based learning can provide opportunities for students to build from their experiences and their cultural vantage point. It allows them to keep it real to themselves and their identity. Um, so I want to stop uh, for a moment and keep it real by acknowledging that I'm not the first person to talk about authenticity and project-based learning. Um, John Larmer from the Buck Institute had a nice piece on Edutopia about it. And uh, also my mom, who's a lifelong educator, um, actually has an entire book about project-based learning. And she'd be mad if I didn't give her the same treatment Dennis got. So um, <laughs> there's me with, with her book. Um, and if you talk to her, make sure you tell her about all those little things on the pages like, so she knows that I, I really read it. Um, but in the book, she, she, she outlines the six A's of project-based learning. Um, and the first A she talks about is actually authenticity. Um, she only has six. Buck Institute has eight, but if you all accept the ninth, then you'll have 50% more. So um, just another motivation, potentially. Um, 
But she talks about authenticity, John talks about authenticity. I think that my, what I'm really trying to emphasize is the importance of culture and identity and that type of authenticity to young people. In her book, she talks about how psychologists say that a drive for authenticity and identity are a central preoccupation of the teenage years. So not just for the hip hop generation or community, but for all teenagers, that's something that's important. Um, and then she later quotes uh, William Kilpatrick, who was a colleague of John Dewey's, saying, it's an inherent feature of purposeful activity that we begin with the interests of the pupil. We begin there because there is nowhere else to begin if we are to get, as we must, self-activity from the child, right? So connecting with what matters most to students is clearly not a new idea, because he said that in like 18 something, but um, we're not doing it enough, and I want to encourage and challenge us to do it more. Um, so. Just a quick story for my hip hop fans, since it seems like we have a few. Um, within a decade in the late um, 1980s, early 1990s, um, there's a school in Brooklyn called Westinghouse Career and Technical High School. Had four, had a lot of students, but four students it had in that 10 year period. The Notorious B.I.G., Lil' Kim, Busta Rhymes, and Jay-Z, all coming through the school. Only Busta graduated from the school, <laughs> okay? But they all went on to become some of the most respected hip hop artists um, of all time, not just cultural icons, but really cultural creators and innovators. Imagine if that high school could have engaged their interests, their talents, their identity. And think about all the young, other young people, like my students Matthew and Jacob, who have that potential, but because we don't properly engage them, never make it to the spotlight, or never make it at all. Um, so for my non-hip hop fans, I'm gonna share a slightly different metaphor about this one. Um, and this is a concept that comes from urban planning, right? So sometimes when folks are planning outdoor space, um, they just decide where they want the paths to be and they pave them. But other times they seed grass everywhere, right? And then they see where the people carve a path and they call that lines of desire, like that path through the middle there. And I think it's a great metaphor for what we need to do as educators. It's a little different for us than it is for the urban planners, right? Because whereas they're looking for a general pattern of where the people walk and then they're paving there, you know, I believe that we should be looking at each individual student and where they're walking and trying to provide the right grounding for them. And then that's the other piece, right, is that while urban planners are generally going to use some form of concrete, it's going to be pretty similar, you know, for us as educators, we're looking to provide a different alchemy for every student to put the right um, formula and blend under their feet. Um, so I want to come back to Aaliyah and, and um, let you uh, see the rest of her video. And in this uh, segment, she also talks about how this project resonated with her identity and how getting to do something that involved music and also the furthering of her education really inspired her you know, to do high quality work. So um, I was able to do it in a project based way. And so I was able to interest myself and interest others as well. You know, it's kind of like you have that pop beat, you have all that, which makes people listen to it, but then you're also having a good message that people need to hear. If a brand new student came to the school and asked me how would they do a project like mine, I would tell them to research. I would tell them to find out what they want to do a project on, find out the message that they want to be heard. I would tell them to think about the audience that they want to deliver the message to. I would I'd tell them to to embrace what they're talking about and really and feel passionate about it so when they do the project, it'll come off and it'll be natural. I don't know what difference I made in the world, but I do know that this video is gonna be shown all over the country. So I know students are gonna be able to see about PSEO and hear about IB and AP courses. So I'm just hoping that they'll take the time to research it themselves and find out about it. So High School for Recording Arts for me allows me to learn the way I wanna learn. They, I love to, I love music. I love to sing. I love to write. I love to play. I love to and anything with music. I'm about it. So high school for recording arts allows me to learn about history, learn about future, learn about everything in a way that interests me and keeps me wanting to learn more. Hey everyone, it's Aaliyah Lene, and I'm here to tell you to enroll yourself in college preparation courses. Get prepared for college. Get involved with post-secondary enrollment options, college and schools, advanced placement, and international baccalaureate. That's PSCO, CIS, AP, and IB. You control your past, your present, and your future. Unfortunately, I, I have another great video um, as well from another student named Domino, who I'll show a picture of in a second, um, talking about another project that they did. I'll tell you really quickly about it. I, I, I'm calling it an ambitious real world project because they've been doing project based learning for 15 years. Um, and so they've embarked on this project in the past, I think, two years with State Farm Insurance, um, who came to them and said, um, we really want to do something about the dropout epidemic. 
Um, can you engage with us on that? And so they came up with this 26 second campaign because on average every 26 seconds a student in this country drops out of school. Um, and they designed, the students at the school designed the logo, um, they put out a CD, they've been touring around the country. I got to ride on a, a tour bus with them in California which was really fun and go visit some schools. Um, they've created a Facebook page um, and they partnered also I should mention with LeBron James, he's the tall one. So obviously it's a very sophisticated project, but it's been really cool to watch because each of the students, that's little C in the front there um, with their four fingers up. It's been really cool to watch each student find their own role and, and get really passionate about this project in different ways. And this is Domino, who uh, there's a video on the uh, HSRA website, which I'll show here. Um, and you can see it's at the bottom, hsra.org. Um, and then in the top, you'll see that yellow link, watch and listen now. You can see a bunch of videos from the school. They've got some really great content, including Domino talking in depth about the 26 seconds project. Um, so I want to leave you where the High School for Recording Arts began. Um, and you may be looking at this and thinking that it's an album cover. It is. Um, but that's also the principal of the school, or the founder of the school, I should say, David T.C. Ellis. And I think his story is, is, is relevant to us as we take um, this week here to think and talk about project-based learning and changing our practice and then go back um, to our home communities. T.C., like many of the students at his school, did not have a successful experience um, in traditional school. And it was actually a real world project for him that was relevant to his life that finally got him engaged. He was in an alternative program and a teacher, Joe Nathan, came to him and said, um, hey, do you want to learn how to uh, protect your money? And that resonated for him. And um, he got involved and it was a consumer protection class. And they were really going after businesses that were screwing over customers and uh, um, you know, trying to get justice for them. So D David got involved in that. Um, and went from there to a, a career in the recording arts, which, which is a really um, incredible story. After his career in the recording arts was done, he was running a recording studio in St. Paul, and he had a group of young men who kept hanging around the studio and saying they really wanted to um, make music. And he was saying, well, you should probably go to school, and they were saying, we don't want to, and he was saying, yeah, I kind of understand that. I didn't really want to go either. Um, so he called up his old alternative school principal and decided that he was going to start a school out of his recording studio. Um, and that was the genesis of the High School for Recording Arts. About 10 young people in a recording studio in St. Paul, um, a guy who had no formal training as an educator, but a real passion around it, and a real belief and fundamental internal understanding of the power of project-based learning. Um, so this is TC now, and I wanted to share one other example of what I'm calling, you know, in, in hip-hop we like to make up words, I'm calling it swagacity. It's a mix of what, what a lot of people call swagger, which is kind of a style and a bravado, with audacity, right? Because that's something that I think TC really embodies. Um, and so one other story I'd like to share, I think I was sharing it with Alan John the other night, was just that um, when TC first started the school, a lot of the young people were showing up um, late. And as a consequence, they were being marked absent. It was causing problems. And he decided he wanted to start the school day at 10 AM. He said, I don't really like getting up early. The kids don't seem to like getting up early. Let's just start the day at 10 AM. And everyone said, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. School starts at 8. And he said, well, why? Show me you know, where it says I have to start school at 8 AM. And no one could show him. So he said, OK, we're starting school at 10 AM. It turns out that it worked great. Attendance went up. Lateness went down. Um, and then research shows that teenagers' circadian rhythms are more aligned with the later start time. And a lot of the research shows that a lot of the crime and violence that happens with young people is in the hours of 3 to 6 PM when his students are still in school, avoiding all that drama. So, you know, it really took that audacity, and there was a lot of people doubting and pushing back, and that's been true almost every step of the way. I mean, you can imagine as someone coming, um, you know, with their primary um, thing on their resume that they have been a rapper coming into the school space, starting a school, that TC has met a lot of resistance for a lot of his ideas, but he's brought that swagacity. And so I hope that if, if he can do it, um, that you all won't let anyone, least of all yourselves, um, stop you as you go back and you know what's right and you know what's going to work for young people, bringing that to your work. So um, I want to end. Um, this is my last slide, and it has the most words on it. But I wanted to give you um, three good questions to take away. Because I know in traditional schools, we're very preoccupied, it seems, these days with getting the right answers. And we all know that it's really more important to have the right questions, right? Um, so the first one is to ask yourself and your colleagues in a nice tone, every time you're beginning to work on a project, how can I make this project that I'm developing realer? And sometimes it's not any more work to make something real. Sometimes it's actually more work, right, to fabricate a whole new environment and scenario. Um, and I also want to emphasize that realer doesn't necessarily have to mean outside the building. And I thought um, John Larmer had a really nice piece in one of the th uh, pieces he wrote uh, where he talked about school being a very real place for students. And I think that's totally true. A lot can happen there. It's a very, that's, 
a place they have to go every day, and a lot of their life occurs there, and a lot of their friends and social network and mentors are there, hopefully. Um, so, you know, within schools, there's an incredible number of real world projects you can do. You can teach other students about things, that, especially things that really matter to them. It can be younger students or peers. Um, these days, with all the technology we have, students can do projects like what Aaliyah and Mike are doing, never leaving a school building, never having to go literally into the real world, but putting all this stuff out into the real world using digital mediums, right? You can start a petition online or a blog about something you're passionate about. So there's all these ways that students can do projects that really exist in the real world without having to cross that line of stepping out of the building if that's really presenting a challenge. Um, the second question that, uh, that I want to leave you with is ask your students what they love to do and what they love to make. Deborah Meyer, who's a you know education guru, um, I once heard her speaking and she talked about watching at the end of the day and seeing um, students bound out the doors of a school and teachers kind of drag out looking exhausted. And she said, I would love to see a school where the students drag out because they're so tired from doing and making things and the teachers bound out because they have lots of energy because they've just been, you know, they're supporting, cheering on the students, right? And I, I loved that. You know, one of the two reasons that students um, say, or no, sorry, um, one out of every two students say that they're bored in school every day. Um, and it's the most common reason that students give for dropping out. And when asked why they're bored, they say because the stuff going on isn't relevant to their lives and, and the world that they live in. Um, there's another book, I, unfortunately I don't have a picture of me advertising it, but it's called um, Youth Learning on Their Own Terms, and it's by a guy named Leif Gustafsson. And in it, he follows three students, and they're all very engaged in these projects outside of school. One's a DJ, um, one makes zines, and one does graffiti. Um, and he looks at them pulling all-nighters and practicing incessantly and really mastering these crafts and holding these incredibly high standards for themselves, higher than standards that we hold in school. Um, and they're doing it outside of school. So you know, if we ask students what they love to do and what they love to make and find ways to incorporate that, we can bring that same passion and rigor into the classroom. And then the last question is ask your students what they want to see change in the world. And I think just asking this question, like the one before, is surprisingly unusual in schools. And students have answers. Um, in my mom's book, there's an example of a student uh, named Karen who does this total 180. She goes from um, only caring about academics insofar as it allows her to um, stay on the cheerleading team to becoming an honor roll student. And it's because she's asked this question. Um, and it, it turns out that um, none of her teachers knew that she had a brother who was HIV positive. And so she got to do a project around HIV awareness and letting folks know about the kinds of care available. And this got her and actually her group of friends engaged in a school in a way that they previously hadn't been. So I really believe that asking this question is key and sometimes you know, is, is the inflection point um, for finding your students' lines of desire um, and figuring out how to provide the right footing beneath them. So, I know you're all here because you're already on this journey. Um, and I hope, you know, coming in, I didn't get to do the first day big kickoff, all the energy. You might be a little tired from working so hard yesterday. And this also isn't the end where I get to like really leave you with the super, you know, inspiring um, end message because you've got a lot more work to do here. But I hope I'm like one of those people during the marathon who like runs alongside and tries to hand you a <laughs> cup of water or, or maybe splashes some cold water on you and maybe also has a little dish of food for thought. Um, <laughs> Or as one of my favorite rappers, um, Nas, says, mind wine, which seemed very appropriate here in, in Napa. Um, good luck with the work. Um, I'm really excited to see what you all do. Um, and no matter what, please keep it real. Thank you. <laughs>